Welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate. I'm Will Tanaka with my co-host, business partner and wife, Leonie Lam. Thanks, Will. Today we're going to be talking about the psychology of real estate. And we're so excited to be talking with our good friend, Jay Fidel. He's going to be asking us some questions and we're excited to jump right into it. And as everyone knows, Jay is a CEO of Think Tech Hawaii. So we really appreciate your time. I'm not a psychologist, though. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, I, I mean, I, I've been through transactions, and so I could ask you about how people react. So, you know, the first thing is most people, I mean, you can disagree on this, most people, it's a lifetime deal. In other words, they're buying a house for themselves, their family. It's probably, but not all the time, their only transaction, their first transaction. And so they have certain reactions to this transaction because it is the first time they've been through the process. Am I right? Yeah. That is absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's definitely true. Uh, we just helped a first time home buyer get into her very first place. And it is quite a journey. Um, she had kind of told us from the beginning, though, that it was going to be a place that she would live, but that eventually, you know, depending where her work took her, she was going to be possibly traveling and so maybe using it as an investment property at some point in the future to help her to level up to get to a bigger place. Well, we should talk about the sales side of things too, but, uh, you know, I'm talking right now anyway, asking right now about the, you know, the family that has think they, they think they've saved up enough money. Um, they right. want to catch the market before it's too late. Uh, they're not really all that happy with, with you know, where they're living right now. And so and so um, they're about to buy a home. I guess it's possible for them to look online and find properties. But gee, for somebody who has not bought a home before, that sounds really dangerous. Um, they got to have somebody to step them through this. Uh, otherwise, mm, gee whiz, the risk is much greater of having a psychological experience they will they will not enjoy. Am I right? Absolutely. And the whole home purchase, I mean, just from our own experiences, it gets very emotional. It's an emotional roller coaster um, from you know searching for a home to negotiating to going through the actual escrow process. So not only is there a the logical aspect of it because you know you you have to determine like are you able to afford a certain price range right but beyond the logical on paper aspect of it there's the the heart the mind the, all the psychological aspect of it number one is you know from a buyer's standpoint uh, with all these online uh, resources I mean everything's everything's out there so you know. They look at a house, they're like, oh, you know what? I think I could afford this. And then we get into negotiation and already, even you know, if there's any inclination that it's going to be a multiple offer situation, their emotions, their excitement and anxiety gets heightened. So this is where I think the realtors come in, the, the experts to really say, hey, here's the facts and here's what it could be here's a market range so give them the facts factual situation at the same time just really work th them through the the negotiation process because the purchase contract it's pretty much a pre-written 14 page contract so it's on paper it's pretty straightforward right with that said there's a lot of nuances to it to give our buyers a competitive advantage now you talk about advantage, you know, uh, I guess that's part of what I would imagine that a buyer is afraid of. He's afraid of getting screwed and tattooed. He's afraid of getting cheated. He's right. afraid of paying too much. He's afraid of not finding something that's really wrong about this property. Um, he's afraid of, you know, the scenario where he pays the money, moves in, and a week later, something collapses on him or something, you know, is discovered that is that that was not known and that, that is of, of you know of, of great concern mm -hmm. so that's one part i i'm i and i'm asking you a multiple compound question but the other part is um speaking of you know husband and wife um this is a family decision 
usually, usually, not always, but usually, and he's got to talk with his family. And that certainly means, his, I, I should say, his or her family, uh, his or her spouse, and maybe the children, if they're old enough to understand what's going on, and maybe some friends. And he's got to, you know, he's got to educate himself and he's got to educate them. And he's got to worry about that because he doesn't want them to disagree with him later. Uh, in fact, he doesn't want them to disagree with him now either. And so, you know, and there you are, you are, call it the psychological broker. I used to have an accountant who called himself a psychiatric accountant because he figured that, you know, in all of this business stuff, <clears throat> there is psychology. And he had to deal with people's, you know, fears and concerns. Um, so here you are. You have a person uh, who is, or a family, that's trying to do the biggest deal of their lives um, and who is worried because they heard stories, right? They heard stories about how people got screwed. Um, so how do you, as the broker, deal with that? I mean, is there anything you can do? Is it is it something that you plan to do? And the last part of my multiple compound question is, suppose they're really paranoid. How do you handle that? You know, I'll take the... I'll take part of the compound question. And so one thing that we really enjoy doing, or at least one of the things I like doing the best is when we first meet clients, especially when they're looking to purchase something, you know, that they're going to occupy and live in. One thing that I really do is watch them carefully. So from, from the beginning, from whether they're pushing property to us or whether we're identifying property to show them, it's a study. And it is interesting because you really see by observ observation and conversation, you know, you start to understand what is important to them. And oftentimes it's not exactly what they've set out right up front. You know, sometimes they say, okay, this is what we're looking for. And then as you go through a process and build a relationship, a truly caring relationship with trust, that's the only way to really distill down what exactly they're looking for. And it oftentimes is two decision makers. It could be three decision makers or more. And so it's understanding what's important to each one. Where does that align? And how are you going to blend that together into finding the right and suitable property that might be a consideration? And even then, sometimes it's not the right one for whatever the reason, maybe the location, neighborhood, et cetera. So I think it's the observation. It's key. And so that's where we come in to kind of really help. And I, I almost feel sometimes like it could be a therapy thing because, you know, when you're dealing with big money or anything that's a risk, like you're talking about, it brings up a lot of stuff for people and everybody, we all have stuff. And so we see that coming out and we kind of got to distill through that and make sure that we're able to help them make an educated decision and in what's best for their situation. And just to add to that, for example, one of our clients would say, no view, I don't care about the views. And in the end, they had to have a view and they purchased a property with a view of the ocean. And, you know, just to answer your other parts of your uh, multiple questions, Jay. Um, so if a client, if a buyer is, let's say they're to give a percentage, 80%, they want the house, but they're not 100%, but they're 80% then what we advise them is let's write up an offer with a price that you're comfortable with in the terms because there's going to be at least three active out clauses to cancel the transaction, get your money back. One is the J1 home inspection, two is a seller's disclosure review, three is a title report review. And if it's part of a condo or another homeowners association, that will be the fourth out clause, review of the condo or association documents. So even if they're not quite sure after they do their due diligence, and oftentimes they just want to proceed. Sometimes they don't. And even if like, oh my God, this is our dream house, but then they do their home inspection and they're like, okay, it's too many, way too many repairs. It's not our dream house anymore. So the emotion aspect, you know, kind of goes away. It's like, oh, okay. Realistically, it's too much, um, you know, too much uh, work, electrical plumbing and all that. So I think there's always a balancing factor of the emotion psychology and okay, what's the facts of the house pursuant to the inspections? So it's a really in interesting dynamic. It, there's no uh, formula, you know, for each client um, or exact science to this. And, and I think I think that's why I find this fascinating. 
right? In the legal realm, I mean, oftentimes, I mean, there is a gray area, but there's not too much emotions attached. People get emotional, but when it comes to your own home, spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, yeah, I mean, I would get emotional myself. You know, when I, when I, was, a, when I was a kid, I worked in a shoe store. <clears throat> and there are some people who came into the shoe store and they wanted to try on every shoe in the store. And you could always spot that because, it, you know, as they sat down and the shoe salesman would bring out box after box after box um, of shoes, you know, you could see what was going on there. They couldn't make up their minds. They were never really satisfied with any pair of shoes. And, um, and you know, in the end, I, honestly, I mean, my experience as a shoe salesman is when you see that happen, you know they're going to make the wrong decision in the end anyway. <laughs> it's the nervous Nelly decision. So how do you cope with that? There are all kinds, as you said, there are all kinds of personality types, and mm -hmm. some of them are very hard to deal with. Some of them are really fruitcake. I remember one deal <laughs> where he was waiting for a, for a message from God, okay? And he wasn't getting the message. <laughs> and he, he was the ultimate nervous Nelly. So how do you deal with that? I mean, you have to be cool. You have to be calm. You have to understand the dynamics, the psychological dynamics of what is going on, or it will blow up somehow, or he will, you know, leave the scene. Um, how do you deal with that? Have you seen what I'm talking about? We have definitely seen what you are talking about, um, all aspects of it. And I think the first step is for one thing, maintaining a level of professionalism for, for us in our business, our, you know, we need to kind of keep ourselves healthy. I think that's the first thing because we deal with so many different psychological situations and scenarios and emotional, you know, things and different, you know, types of people all the time. So for us, we need to stay healthy. We need to be centered so that we don't get triggered by, you know, different commentary that we hear, or maybe different beliefs. So that's really first and foremost, what's most important. So we need to be centered ourselves so that we can weather and stay poised and, you know, calm in the storm. Because when you're dealing with real estate transactions, there is, it, it's, it's just notorious to have a lot of emotion behind it, unless it's an investor. Investors are a little bit different. It's more about the numbers, but I would say for any home buyer or home sellers, we didn't even talk about that yet. There is a ton of emotion behind it. There's family dynamics behind it. There's infighting, you know, like civil wars sometimes and things like that. So I think that it starts with, you know, for example, Will and I just being as healthy as possible ourselves so that we're able to really take care of people with an open heart, not no judgment and just kind of understanding strategically what we can do to help them through get whatever they want or through whatever they need to get through. So anytime we go to a, you know, we show a property, open house, private showing, Leonie's excellent at just, at least from a visual standpoint, you know, pointing out, okay, there's some cracks, there could have been some water leaks. Um, so at least from a visual inspection, from a buyer standpoint, it's like, oh, okay. So there could be already, um, at first glance, something's, you know, that's already wrong with the property, right? So in terms of going into it, I mean, did they have to go into it with the price they're comfortable with at the same time, knowing that, okay, could there be some negotiations in escrow possibly as long as, you know, it affects the safety or hazard and, um, maybe something they, you know, that didn't come up from a, a quick visual inspection. So I think just really manage your expectations. Say, hey, you know, guys, this is a 1955 home, right? So there are going to be things wrong with a property, number one. So you, you're you not buying a new home. Uh, that, that's number one. Another good example is oftentimes from a uh, Hawaii customary standpoint, some people are very conscientious about when people pass away in the home. That's becoming even more common because people don't want to go into nursing care homes or they can't afford to. So um, oftentimes people, you know, will disclose that they passed away in the home. And some cultures or some families, they, they're they like, no way. I don't want, you know, if someone passed away, even if it's a natural death, I don't want any part of it. Some other people, we might suggest, well, you could get it blessed from a um, ordained kahu. So that that may have worked. So it really depends on people's cultural or, you know, their own personal experience or beliefs. People it, have superstitions. I mean, I remember one 
where you know the closing was set for a certain day of the month. And um, she didn't say anything at first, but after a while, we get closer to that day. She said, my God, that num the number of the day of the month means death. We can't possibly close on that day. <laughs> exactly, so yeah. Change the day. <laughs> So what about the cold feet situation, you know, because people go into this, uh, they have a lot of trepidation about it. You know, maybe the family agreed at first, but their family has trepidation, what, what have you. And you're into the deal. You're rolling up your sleeves. You're preparing, you know, for a close. You're providing documents, all this. <clears throat> so the question is, what happens when your client, the buyer, or your family client, the buyer's get cold feet to come to you and they say, Will, Leone, you know, I'm, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning last night. I really can't do this. I can't do it. What do you do? It actually happens. In fact, it, it just happened recently. Yeah. So, so from uh, when we represent the buyers, one of the first things we're always looking out for is to protect the buyer's initial deposit. That that's gonna be number one. You know, any finance. So there's gonna be upfront cost for the inspections, sewer scope, um, PV roof inspections, possibly. So it, it could be anywhere between one to two thousand dollars upfront cost that they're not gonna get back. But that's part of the due diligence of buying a home. In terms of getting cold feet, it happens. That that's human nature. So they were probably at you know eighty percent, or they could have been at ninety nine percent, but all of a sudden they changed their mind. And, and under Hawaii law, I mean, that there's a lot of protection for the consumers, and it's in particular the buyers. So that's why you have all these cancellation clauses and still get your deposit back. So we always, and you know, the J one home inspection usually anywhere between ten to fifteen days. That's probably the most common way for people to cancel, especially um, you know in escrow. So we always ask when there's a couple of days remaining before that expiration. Do you guys really want the home? Are you guys good with it? And I mean, there's a lot of communication, you know, in escrow. Oh. I would add to that too. I mean, in terms of the way it is in Hawaii real estate, I think it's it's different in other states from what I understand. But you know, in Hawaii real estate, you do showings as a buyer, you go into a house, you spend, I don't know, anywhere between like 30 to 60 minutes taking a look, and then you decide if you want to put in an offer pretty much, right? So then you have this period of due diligence that Will is talking about where you have the opportunity as a buyer to inspect the hell out of that house and find out exactly what it is that you're buying. And so I think during that time, it is not uncommon for buyers to get cold feet and we can recognize it, feel it, see it, hear it. And we want to talk through that and help them to understand what the real costs are going to be associated with making this purchase, making it into what they want. Because every house in Hawaii, even the new construction, there's always going to be things wrong with it. So it just really depends on the client's personal threshold and then financial ability to remedy those things. Because there's always a solution for everything. Even when there's foundation issues, there's a solution for that, right? It's just going to cost. So we look at all those factors and we just... We try to be the calm in the storm for them in terms of the cold feet aspect and really just give them the facts, give them the numbers so they can make an informed decision. And, you know, sometimes it is purely emotional and that, you know, we can't really, we can just offer support, but, you know, if it really is just an emotional thing for them, they woke up and they just felt like, you know, it was someone told them that it's just not going to be the house for them or something that's, that's difficult to manage. And that would be their choice that we would fully support to make sure that they can get out. Well, you talk about uh, cancellation provisions, and uh, certainly in the standard form and deposit receipt agreement, um, there's going to be you know cancellation provisions. But sometimes, <clears throat> check your own experience and let me know. Sometimes the reason they want out is not listed in those provisions, and so mm -hmm. they would come to you all stressed out, and say, "We want to get out, but we don't know how to get out because it's not." really covered <clears throat> and and we are you know we are really in crisis now because our deposit is at risk maybe a lawsuit is at risk how how do you handle that um i'm sure it happens when you know um they thought they could get out but they can't yeah so so it does happen so all the contingency timelines have passed and let's say that they have a loan right um, the only remaining contingency out clause 
is the loan. And it, it would have to be like a legitimate loan denial, like they buy a new car or something or pay off a big debt to affect their credit scores. But I mean, pretty much if there's no out clause, there's a possibility that they could lose their deposit. With that said, I've seen situations, especially more when I was in escrow, where either, you know, they're really kind sellers, depending on, you know, I've seen them say, okay, you know what? I feel bad for you, buyer. I understand your personal situation. I will let you out and give your deposit back. I've seen other situations where they might just keep half the deposit, which, you know, maybe they're entitled to the entire 20,000, but they're only keeping 10,000. And, and that's a good so-called settlement, uh, like a middle ground, because it was an escrow for a couple months. It wasn't marketed for two months. And that's the cost for the buyer to the seller to say, hey, okay, you know, I'll only keep half. And on the extreme end, yeah, I mean, the seller's like, I'm going after your all your deposit. So, mm. so it, it will depend on the situation. Um, and, and this is where emotions, right? I mean, it's not logically, maybe the buyers might not be entitled to get any of the deposit back because all the contingency timelines have passed and there's no way to get it. Um, at the same time, if um, they have a legitimate reason a death in the family, a divorce or something happened. And the seller, from an emotional human perspective, they'll make that decision. Yeah, you've got to you've got to present this to the the seller or the seller's broker or maybe the seller's lawyer. What uh Leone, when do the lawyers get involved? You know, what Will talks about sounds to me like <laughs> you you probably you know will you should um you know get a lawyer at least to talk to him or her on um, you know on the back end not not necessarily repeat you know to the other side what the lawyer is advising but at least get some advice what what do you think about that well from the beginning when we when we form a relationship with a new client or any of our clients i mean we all, we tell them off the bat we're not cpas we're not attorneys um our special all the will is an attorney um licensed attorney but then we tell them that our our role with you is as a realtor you know as a broker and so we're going to help you with, we have a specific list of items per our agreements and things like that. So from there, we always tell them and encourage them, if you would like to enlist legal counsel, CPA, I mean, definitely the professionals, the more that you can consult, the better for your situation, because everyone's situation is different. So we always encourage that. And then, you know, if things were to get into a contentious situation, then of course they would want to seek legal counsel. So I would say that's when it could be involved. It could e they can even hire an attorney to help them to review condo docs. And some clients do, you know, to make sure that it's not like you're probably going to change the condo docs, but interpretation and simplification and knowing what questions to ask in terms of legal professional is the best way to go. Yeah, moral support, psychological support. Okay, I wanted to ask one other thing. You know, not, you can quote me on this, not every real estate company are nice guys. Some real estate brokers are real jerks. I'm sorry. And by the way, some real estate lawyers are real jerks. <clears throat> so what do you do uh, when you find out you're, you know, you have a real jerk on the other side and that person is trying to to play you. Now, when I say play, I mean, you know, use a, a strategy to get the, mm -hmm. you know, the price up the, or the price down, whatever side you're on. And I'll just give you a short example that comes to mind. I knew okay. a real estate, real estate guy who had the bed trick. Okay. He would go in and make an offer for a house. And he would say, I want to have the bed. It has to be in the in the, in the deposit receipt agreement. I want the bed, and and the people you know who, who had been there, the sellers, they they were wedded to the bed. I mean, it was their wedding bed. They had been sleeping in that bed for you know decades and decades and decades. It it meant a lot to them. It doesn't have to be a bed. It could be something else. But he would go in knowing, okay, that they cared a lot about the bed. Okay, and and then he would use that when they said, "No, we can't give you the bed." And then he would say, "Well, you know, I I'm sorry, I got I got to take twenty thousand dollars off the price because I wanted the bed." He didn't care about the bed. 
He was using them. He was playing them. And he did it every time, every time. <laughs> so what do you do when you find that the other side is playing you? That, that's a funny one. I haven't heard of that one. <laughs> I, I, I think, you, you know, in terms of you mentioned jerks and people who are playing you, I think in the end, we're always trying to do what's in the best interests of our client, right? I mean, that, that that's what I like to think, not in the best interest of the realtors and ourselves, but in the best interest of the clients. So in terms of mind games and psychological games, absolutely it happens. Just like in litigation, it happens. You know, there's posturing, there's um, strategy involved. What we do is, I mean, from the beginning, we do manage our clients' expectations. And then two, I, I mean, if they're um, kind of posturing too much, we might just call them out in a very friendly way, right? So I, I think in terms of um, like, for example, if there's multiple offers, we always ask if you represent the buyers, how many offers do you have in hand? And I would say 99% of the time, I, I, I would hope that they'll answer, right? No, we have no offers in hand or we have multiple offers in hand. I mean, one time I remember on a transaction, um, I think we were the only offer to be honest with you. But then the listing agent said she had another offer in hand. And after asking, you know, different questions in various ways, I realized, you know what? I think she was bluffing to get our price up. So, so it's kind of interesting um, how, you know, people might be jerks. They might be friendly, but they're lying, right? <laughs> so it, it's kind of um, really asking the right questions and trying to pull as much detail as possible. At the same time, it's sometimes even us, I mean, we don't like to give that much information, right? I mean, in terms of if you have multiple offers, I'm not going to say very much about the offers we have in hand. We'll say, yes, we have offers in hand and just kind of keep it generic. So I, overall, it's it's fun, but I think it's asking the right questions and also like Leone always said relationships really matter in the industry. And do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I was going to just tag on to what you're saying with this commentary, just saying that this is Hawaii, right? And so Hawaii real estate is reflective of the general culture that we have here. It's not a small town. We've gotten pretty large, especially here on Oahu, but it's a small community, still tight knit. And especially within any industry, but like real estate industry, for example, it's, it, it is a lot about reputation and it's a lot about, um, you know, doing business with the same brokers over and over again, because there's a very small amount of brokers out of the 6,500 licensees, right? There's a very small amount that are actually doing this full time as their careers. There's many people that are licensed, but not many that are actually doing it. So we cross paths with each other over and over again. And there is, you know, vast knowledge in knowing how people do business and different things. So we know when we're walking into something, usually, you know, what we're walking into and we're able to kind of navigate it as best as possible representing our clients and also even setting our clients expectation for what to what 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 we're encountering and every transaction is different so it depends but yeah to your point i mean just like in any industry there's going to be the ones that you really enjoy working with and the less favorable ones but we just do our best to navigate it you know in in the best way that we can and we remain professional no matter what well, you know, uh, Will's comments and your comments, Leonie, do, do raise another question, and that is relevant to our discussion today. Using psychology in, in I hate to use this term, in the art of the deal. Ooh, what a terrible mm -hmm. term that is. Uh, <laughs> and, and um, you know, I just wonder, you know, you're looking across the table at your opposite, your broker, lawyer, you know, the seller, the other side. And you got to try to figure out uh, if they're really, you know, exaggerating the value, under undervaluing, overvaluing, not telling you something, not telling you about these other offers that are in somebody's pocket. Um, and so it's it sounds like a it's it's a two part question. It's one is what is the level of external due diligence? You know what I mean? It's like let's look in the paper. Let's look at Pacific Business News. Let's do a Google on these people. 
to see how, how much trust and confidence we can invest in them. And the other is to formulate call it a, a psychological profile, a psychological strategy in dealing with these human beings on the other side. Now, I know, you know, this is a small town, and what people do will, will follow them in terms of reputation going forward. They can't afford, you know, to be a wise guy forever. However, there are those that where you will benefit, your client will benefit if you know more about the other side, both the professionals, quote, uh, and also the principles. So how how much of that do you do, should you do? How much psychology should you use in terms of mm, negotiating the deal? That's a great question. Th that's a loaded question, Jay. So in terms of the research we do for our buyers, and Leonie is... Um, the expert. I mean, she does a way better job than me in just digging deep into the details of if you represent the buyer, the seller profile, uh, what the seller might be looking for, or you know what they do, and then just um, studying the comps, driving the comps. So we have a pretty um, comfortable range that we give our buyers after we do all our analysis online, in person, just by drive by, and of course looking at it in person. And then also when we represent the sellers, I think equally we do um, due diligence. I mean, we pull like the permits, we go down to the department of planning and permitting to pull the plans up front. So we have all the documentation. So once we go live on the market, any questions that they, I mean, we might not know all the answers, but I think we have a lot of the answers that a prospective buyer or the buyer's agents may have. So it is putting in the work up front where, I mean, no one really sees it except for, I see what Leonie does and, you know, I try to support it in my own ways, but she could crunch numbers like I've never seen before, so. And adding on to that, it's it's like for being able to provide a pretty comprehensive study to a potential, you know, to our clients so that they can make an informed decision because just because we present them with a range of what Will and I think, and sometimes Will and I don't even agree. So we have our own ranges, but it, it still really comes down to what the client feels comfortable with and what is feasible for them and their situation. And so you know, it's a great conversation starter to get aligned to see where we need to be with pricing. And it, it's going to come down to their budget and what their comfort level is. So whatever our stats are and all the things that we provide to supplement and help them to come to a decision on that, it it's almost irrelevant sometimes. I think it's it's appreciated and um, for some, it depends on the client, but it really is going to come down to what's their monthly going to be. Are they going to be able to handle all those repairs or whatever modifications that they're looking to make and things like that. So it's just a conversation starter. And then ultimately we we're like just facilitators, right? It's a converse, any transaction, it's just a conversation between the seller and the buyer. And we're just their facilitator, their representative, their broker. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting thing. I think, um, you know, we definitely do do a lot of research and even understanding who we're working with, you know, on the on the other side, whether it be the agent or even the seller or the buyer, just kind of really understanding as best as we can. We usually try to get as much information from the other agent, you know, about tell us about your client. And we try to understand, like, you know, if they're moving off island to be with a, their kid or if they're just moving because of a job. I mean, it's all kind of it's all related in in terms of the level and the depth that we go to to try to really understand and and try to create a win-win situation you know the, um this raises the question of transparency um if uh, you guys don't exactly agree on pricing if you don't agree on any aspect of the deal is this something you're going to tell your client um if you find that um the your opposite number your opposite realtor or lawyer uh, spent seven years in federal prison over a drug uh, a drug charge, um, and you found out, and uh, maybe that goes to that person's credibility in terms of these discussions you're describing. Um, do you tell your client? Because your client is, by definition, concerned, sometimes very concerned, sometimes rationally, sometimes irrationally. How much of this do you share with your, your client? And, and these are awesome questions. I mean, you're, you're like the best guest <laughs> slash co-host. But, you know, in terms of um, we're pretty transparent. I, I think Leonie, she's like a straight shooter. 
And uh, in terms of anything that we find, we do share with our clients. So, and in terms of like when she has a certain price and I have another price, we actually share that as well. So we might not be 100% on the same page and we're pretty open about that. And I, I think that that's why our clients do respect us that, you know, we're not trying to agree on everything. I, I think we're aligned in most things, but sometimes our prices are, you know, not exactly on point. So, so that's why like every transaction, every client, I mean, we're so passionate about it. We love it. My last question is this. We, we really didn't cover in any great detail the, the situation where you're representing a seller. Mm -hmm. And I just want to fold that into one question. From a psychological point of view, you know, the, the psychology that you have to deal with and bring out, is it greater when you're representing a seller than a buyer? Uh, could you comment on the comparison of psychological issues that may mm -hmm. come up when you're representing a seller rather than a buyer? I think it's the same. I mean, it's it's still you're still dealing with clients, right? And you're still dealing with a large asset. And on the sell on the sell side, we we have a lot of listings and we've helped a lot of sellers. And we've seen it all. I mean, it it can be like sometimes there's people that just want to prepare this house for sale and they want to give it to the new buyer exactly as they purchased it. You know, even if it's a 30 year old house or something, they want it to be pristine and they want the new buyer to have that wonderful feeling. And then you have other sellers that don't aren't, aren't able to. They just don't have the funds, the means, the time to prepare the house. And they just, um, you know, but then they still want a certain amount for return on in their investment, right? So it's interesting. And then you have family dynamics. So a lot of cases we're, we're kind of, uh, we have this niche that sort of found us where it's trust and probate sales. So you're dealing with families and feelings and beneficiaries and, and all of those things. And there's a lot of, um, I haven't really come across a super amazing family that was cohesive and all on the same page when it came to property. And so, you know, there's psychology and emotion and, and just kind of understanding, you know, who's who and, and who's actually the signer and, you know, who's actually, but then you have to be courteous and be able to meet with everyone. And so we've had many, many complex situations on that side. So buyers, you know, it's one set of emotions and psychology, sellers, it's another set, but it's kind of the same to me. <laughs> I don't know how Will feels about it. Let me throw in for your answer, Will, to that same question. The whole notion of, and if this was raised by Leone, of as is, where is, no mm -hmm. warranties. Um, how do you deal with that in terms of the psychology? Because some buyers are going to want more than as is, but no seller wants to give you more than as is. You know, that's a great point because you have this form that's often attached with the purchase contract called the as is condition ad addendum. And I think the misconception of the addendum is that you're going into escrow as is, and that's it. You know, you can't ask for repairs, credits, get any concessions. But when you read it, it actually says you're taking the property as is when you close on the property, when you take title to the property. So no one technically goes into escrow you, or, you know, you sign the contract and open escrow as is. You, that's why you still get to do your due, due diligence during the escrow process. So yes, when it's a competitive situation, you could say, hey, it's as is, we won't ask for any repairs or credits. But in the end, I mean, you do have the option. And if you really want it, it's a competitive situation. You could ask for repairs or credits, but the seller could say, screw you, you know, forget you. We have all these other offers, so we'll just go with them. I mean, that's something that we do set the um, the, the buyer's expectation and also the seller saying that, hey, look at this clean offer, right? But then maybe the seller has, uh, I mean, the buyer has cold feet or they might ask for something that was unexpected. And then the seller gets all emotional, right? We pick them because of they were the best buyer and, you know, they have a family or, you know, something like that. And, oh, you're not supposed to discriminate based on That's Shami right. or any, any of the protected classes. So I better be lawyer. careful what I say. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. The bottom line, Jay, 
<laughs> is on both sides equally. There's emotions, heightened emotions. Once you get into escrow, anytime there's money involved, there's always going to be heightened emotions. So this was a fun one. And we really <laughs> appreciate you, Jay. Well, thank you, Will. Thank you, Leone. Will, why don't you close? Well, so on behalf of Jay, our CEO, Leone and myself, I think when it comes to Hawaii real estate transactions, it's just working with a real estate professionals who's going to help you uh, your manage your expectations, kind of help temper your emotional tolls, and just help you strategize so you're ready to get into the psychological warfare. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Leone.